Uh, good morning and welcome to everybody. Glad to see everybody here this morning as we continue our series against all odds, looking at the prophecies that Isaiah made 700 years before Jesus' life. And today we look at ones in the middle of that prophecy that he remained silent. Heavenly Father, we just lift each other up to you, Lord. We lift ourselves up to you to hear and to learn from what your word has to say. We ask that you open our hearts, our eyes, our ears, and our minds to what your word has to say. And I personally pray for the words to be given to me that these people need to hear. Just lift this up to you in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father God, we lift these prayers up to you. The prayers of your children, Lord. Prayers for, for peace and healing for our friends and family who are sick. And for strength and, and, and wisdom to get through taking care of our grandchildren and great-grandchildren, Lord. And we, just, and we thank you for those prayers that you've answered. Prayers of healing, prayers for peace, prayers, just the prayers that we have given you, Lord, and all of those that you've answered for us, Lord. We are so grateful that you have answered all of them, Lord. And we just lift each other up to you, Lord. We lift our nation up to you, Lord, a nation that's hurting and lost, Lord. Many more people come to follow you, Lord. And we know sometimes that starts from the top down, not always from the bottom up, Lord. The people tend to follow our leaders. So may our leaders, our president, our governor, everybody in between, all the way down to our local governments, Lord, may they seek your guidance as they make the decisions for the people that they are governing, Lord. We just ask that their eyes be opened their hearts and minds be directed towards you and they put your will in place when they make their decisions, Lord. And Lord, we especially pray for the people of Ukraine still under an unjust attack from the nation of Russia, Lord. We pray for the, those people, for their strength to persevere, but we also pray for the, the soldiers, the Russian soldiers, Lord, who are fighting a battle that many of them say they don't want to fight. May their leader, Vladimir Putin, come to the realization that this is not the way to do things, Lord. That he gets a revelation from you to stand down, to pull back, and to help the Ukrainian people rebuild what he and his army has destroyed, Lord. We just lift this all up to you, Lord, along with our own military, first responders, doctors, nurses, all those that take care of us, Lord. People that you have gifted with strengths that most of us don't have. Lord, we pray for them, for their peace, for their safety, for their well-being, Lord. And we thank you for what you've done with them. May you keep them and their families safe and healthy, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name as he taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, good morning. Again, and welcome to all of you. Glad to have you here this morning as we continue this series. Glad to have those of you joining us online as well. It's such a pleasure to be here this morning. 
And here we are, week two of our series against all odds. And we finally get to meet, get into the meat and potatoes of the series. We took a quick week, quick and walk through Isaiah 53 last week just to get an overview of what was being said about those prophecies made 700 years before Jesus was born. And the rest of the way we'll examine those that Jesus fulfilled in the last 24 hours of his life. And during that time, Jesus was put on trial not once, but six times. Six different trials. And at least two of them were illegal. All for a crime that he didn't commit. So imagine you were on trial for something you didn't do. There you are standing before court officials, the media, your peers. You know, we all know here in America you get a, a jury of your peers. There may be even some of your friends and family sitting in the, in the court seats, in the audience. You're accused of something you didn't commit. And if found guilty, you will almost certainly face the death penalty. You have no defense attorney. Your friends have abandoned you. Not even your mom and your daddy are there with you by your side. In fact, everything in the, every person in the room seems to be against you. Think about that for a moment. How would you feel? Abandoned? Alone? An attorney doesn't want to step up and defend you. So you're left to defend yourself. What would you do? How would you get yourself out of that situation and back to your life as you knew it? Well, that's exactly where Jesus found himself. In the <coughs> Excuse me in the early morning hours of that Saturday, or excuse me, that Friday, the day after Pentecost, or after Passover, during those final 24 hours of his life, actually it was less than that, not just once, but six times, six different judges, all between the hours of 3 a.m., at 9 a.m. This story, this event, fulfills the first, or is a one of the first prophecies fulfilled as through each trial, Jesus remained silent. That's what we see in verse 7 of Isaiah 53. The night before, they celebrated the Cedar meal, the Passover meal, one of the highest celebrations of Jewish religious tradition. And we've all seen Da Vinci's Last Supper, or some variation of it, but it really isn't historically correct. This picture we have here is probably more accurate. But you can imagine, but could you imagine in this final, or a modern depiction of this final dinner? Jesus says to us, hey bros, let's gather here. Come on, come on, come on, gather around. We have a really important picture to take. Come on over. All of you, all of you. Come on, this side of the table. You know, there Jesus is with his selfie stick and phone taking his picture. After teaching all that he had to his disciples that night, they walked 
uh, probably half a mile, maybe three quarters of a mile from that upper room where they celebrated the dinner to the Mount of Olives. Jesus went off by himself to prayer, pray, a very human prayer, considering who he was and was about to do. And in that prayer, as recorded in Luke, he says, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And we know Jesus was the Son of God, but he was also equally human. And he was terrified of going through this. He really didn't want to, but he knew he had to. So he picked up, you know, he, in order to do what his father, our father, wanted him to do, what he had to do, he picked himself up, pulled up his boots, by both bootstraps and said, and headed back to the others. Now let me read you the rest of our pro the prologue to our story. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went to kid went out with his disciples. Back to Kid across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who had betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officials of the chief priests and Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing that all, all that would happen, came forward and said to him, said to them, Whom do you see? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus calmly said to him, I am he. Judas, who had betrayed him, who was who betrayed him, was standing there with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, Whom do you see? And they said to him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered again, I told you, I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. Talking about the other disciples who were with him. This was to, this was to fill the word that he had spoken of those whom you have given me. I have lost no one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put away your sword, put it into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas. For he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it would be more expedient that one man should die for the people. So here we are. Jesus has been arrested, betrayed by Judas. If you read John's version of this, he says he that Judas walked up to him and, and gave him a kiss so that they would, could identify him. And Jesus, looking out, as he ever always was, for God's children, for the believers, gave himself up and asked that the others be let go because they had not they didn't have anything to do with what was his role. So they tied him up. And here you've got, you know, probably eight to ten soldiers and several priests from the Sanhedrin, amongst other people. 
But they bound Jesus in shackles and walked him that three quarters of a mile back through town. Like some lynch mob. And to be honest with you, when I read through that, I get this image of, uh, I don't know if you remember from the, the animated version of Disney's Beauty and the Beast, but when Gaston led that led the, the crowd to the castle to get the beast, that's what I see this crowd looking like. They tied him up, drug him off to Annas. Annas. As we look at John 18 through 12, 12 through 14, I won't read it again, because we just read it. Annas was the former high priest and son-in-law to Caiaphas, or excuse me, father-in-law to Caiaphas. He was deposed by one of the Roman governors, either Herod, or probably Herod or Pilate, and Caiaphas was put in his place because Caiaphas was more of a yes man and Annas had a little bit more gumption behind him. One of the things that I read said that Caiaphas was the godfather of the Sanhedrin which really gave me this image when Jesus was standing there before him he came out and you hear Annas what do you have to say for yourself? What are you going to do? You have betrayed us. And some refer to this as the, the pre-qualifying trial. Um, the modern day term would be convening the grand jury to see if Jesus was worthy of standing trial. But why is this? He's not the high priest. The son of Moses. Well, if he's the godfather of of the uh, Jew, Jewish uh, religious authority, he may not be in power and name, but he still controls everything. This trial, this trial happened around two or three in the morning. At night, Annas knew he had no jurisdiction, but probably wanted to get a confession out of Jesus, be a witness or the primary witness to this blasphemy that he would proclaim. After all, who would be more trustworthy about a, a claim like this than the, than the former high priest himself? But being as this trial was illegal, according to Jewish law, they could not hold a trial in the dark of night. No charges could be levied against Jesus. And those present knew they had to get Jesus to Caiaphas. And through this, you can see Caiaphas you know, maybe sitting behind a, a big desk that he has in his home kind of way. Marlon Brandon was sitting behind his desk and the Godfather questioning Jesus. And often like those that were brought before the Godfather, better to remain silent than to say something and make yourself guilty. But Jesus made no reply to Annas. One, Annas was irrelevant. And two, there was no convincing Annas otherwise. So on the Caiaphas, the current high priest, and we read from Mark chapter 14, verses 55 through 64. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found no one. Or they, but they found none. Excuse me. 
For many before bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy the temple that is made with his hands, and in three days I will rebuild it another with another, not made with hands. Yet even about their this testimony, it, they did not agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, What further witness do we need? You have heard this blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him. So around 3 a.m., Jesus goes to face Caiaphas. Keep in mind, this trial is also still at night, making it illegal. And over the course of this time, many people come forward and bring false testimony against Jesus. But none were consistent enough to be considered any one of them valid. Two even tried to testify against him over his statements about destroying and rebuilding the temple. And they couldn't get that right. And there were many people in the temple that day when he made those statements. Finally, after a couple of hours, Caiaphas takes matters into his own hands and asks him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Though Mark doesn't record it here, Matthew did, and he put Jesus under oath to record, to, to give an answer. And in doing so, leaves Jesus no choice but to answer the question. And he gave an affirmation to Caiaphas' question, and also likely a prophecy of his return. And that was all Caiaphas needed. And Jesus was charged with blasphemy. And this trial was nothing more than the state's attorney confirming the charges brought by the police when you're arrested. He still had to stand trial before the Sanhedrin, before any charges could be brought. And that had to wait for sunrise. So around 6 a.m., they brought Jesus before the leadership, the Sanhedrin, at that time controlled by the Sadducees. Excuse me. And for all practical purposes, that was nothing more than a preliminary sentencing trial. Reading from Luke, chapter 22, 61 through 71. When day came, the assembly of elders of the people gathered together, both chief priests and scribes, and they led him away to their council. And they said, if you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, if I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. So they all said, Are you the Son of God? And he said to them, You say that I am. Then they say, What further testimony do we need? We have heard it ourselves from his own lips. Heard what? Jesus told them, one, that you will see 
the Son seated at the right hand of the Father. That's just referring to their own scriptures. And two, when they asked if he was the Son, all he said was, you said that I am. That's not an admission. That's not saying I am. I'll give you the Caiaphas. So the council has sentenced him to death for crimes against the state. The state of Israel. Still not worthy of the death penalty. So they took him before Pilate. We read in John chapter 18. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They said to themselves, did not, they themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? And they answered, if this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So Pilate entered his headquarters again, called Jesus, and said to him, Are you king of the Jews? Jesus looked at Pilate, Do you say this of your own accord? Or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from the world. And Pilate said to him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, what is So here we are, three to four hours after his arrest, standing before one man, the governor of Judea, Pontius Pilate. The one man that can put an end to all of this craziness by just saying, no, I'm not going to do it. And he could have done that very easily. Pilate's found him guilty of nothing. In his mind, he committed no crime that deserved death. But when he went back to the Sanhedrin and told them this, they told him that he was from Galilee and he was inciting people against Rome. So Pilate, being the wishy-washy man that he was, Oh, he's from Galilee, is he? Sends him over to Herod. And in Luke, the only one who records the visit to Herod. Luke 3, 23. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over there, who himself was in Jerusalem at that time. And when Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad. For he had long desired to see him, because he had heard about him. And he was hoping to see some sign done by him. So he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer. As Jesus made no answer. The chief priests and scribes stood by vehemently accusing him. And Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then arraying him with splendid clothing, sent him back to Pilate. 
And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day. But before this day, they had been at enmity with each other. So now we're here sitting around 7 a.m. Jesus finds himself in the court of Herod. Herod didn't want him to meet Jesus. He had heard a lot about it. But really, the only thing Herod wanted to see was Jesus perform some kind of a miracle. He could have cared less about what Jewish law said or what the Jews wanted. He wanted to see some, probably from his perspective, some magic trick. And he too found no guilt in Jesus and sent him back to Pilate where this all started. So here we are before Pilate again. Pilate, not knowing what to do, remembers he usually releases a prisoner each day. And so he says this, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? And they cried out, no, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. And Pilate took Jesus, flogged him, and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, behold, the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out even louder, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate said to him again, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the authority to release you and the authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at the place called the Stone Pavement, and in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about to be the sixth hour. So he said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him! Crucify him, Pilate said to them. Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered them over to them to be crucified. Again, Jesus does not defend himself. He asks a couple of questions. He says, This is what you're telling me. Tells Pilate, you have no authority other than what's given to you by God. Pilate, not really sure what to do. He understands a little bit about Jewish religious tradition. He sees the writing on the wall that he's on the verge of inciting a riot in Jerusalem. And his position was not the most stable of positions. As we read in the previous Reading him and Herod weren't the best of friends. 
It's a little better now, but. And he was sent there by Rome to keep the peace, and here he is, almost exciting, a riot. He tries to get out of it, tries to tell them we have not found any guilt in him, but the Sanhedrin would have nothing to do with it and incited the small crowd that was there with him to demand that Jesus be the scapegoat for the nation, crying out, Azazel, Azazel, away with him. Take him away just as our Passover sacrifice is taken into the desert and left there. Pilate tried and tried. No matter what he do, the crowd just got angrier and the boiling point closer. They wanted nothing to do with Pilate's willingness to set Jesus free. But being the fickle leader that he is, he gives in to the people's demands rather than justice. What he didn't know was he was also giving in to the will of God through this whole thing. So as we look at this trial, we see Jesus on occasion spoke up, but for the most part remained silent. When he did speak up, except when he was under oath by Caiaphas, if it did nothing, asked questions back, said things like, well, is, you're, you're saying I am, so what difference does it make? Told Caiaphas, you're not going to change your mind even if I do. Which was true. They had their minds made up. So when do you defend yourself? When nobody else will. The person against you says, you did it. You cheated at a test. You took so-and-so's pencil and pen. Sometimes a friend will speak up on your behalf or somebody else will speak up on your behalf and say, no, he didn't or she didn't. Sometimes we find ourselves without that friend. And we have to stand there and defend ourselves against the accusations of another. We also have to defend ourselves when it will benefit us. If it really makes no difference in the grand scheme of things, is it worth defending? Is it worth inciting an argument? problem here is that Jesus' case really did matter. Which raises the question, why didn't Jesus defend himself? Before the Jewish leaders, when you read through the Gospels and especially the trials, you see that the Pharisees and Sadducees already had their minds made up. They had been Embarrassed by Jesus a couple of times with his teaching. He had accused them of many things. And in their minds was stealing their authority. A defense would have been futile. Before Pilate, Pilate was only out for himself. No matter what Jesus said, he would have done what was needed for him to retain his position as governor. Herod, all he wanted was a magic show. He wanted to see some miracle performed. But he did defend himself ultimately so that he could fulfill all that was said about him. He was innocent there. And there was nothing he could say. Minds were already made up. If he had defended himself with the truth, he would have been set free. And not paid the price for your, your sins or my sins. 
sins that we can't pay the price for. Ultimately, he did not speak up because he loves us. So when you're guilty, you need to admit it. There's nothing wrong with that. Honesty is always the best policy. Admit you're wrong and pay your due. Hmm. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Repent and pay the cost. Do what you need to do to get back in the good graces of the authority over you. Isaiah 53, 6, it says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned oh, everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We have made mistakes, and we need to admit those before God. And when we do, the sacrifice that Jesus made by keeping his silence will be our benefit. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for being silent. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. For me. For them. For all of us. I accept that payment for your sins and invite you to be my Lord, my Savior. Jesus, you were silent before men so that we could have a voice before the Father. Thank you for that. We offer this prayer to you and to the Father in your holy and precious name. Amen. I hope you all have a great week. Enjoy this week. Be careful. The weather's supposed to turn bad later in the week. And we'll see you back here next week when we look at Jesus, who was counted among the rebels. Until then, have a blessed week.